What have we learned, do you think, with the uh, benefit of hindsight about those lockdown measures in early spring? Did they have much of an impact on the trajectory of the virus, in your view? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, most places that locked down were not at any risk in early spring from being how they're having their hospitals overrun. There are a few places that were and it made sense to do those lockdowns there. Were we we lied to or was it just an enormous miscalculation? I I, I think it was largely a, a huge miscalculation where the focus was on the worst places as if every place was the worst place. Mm. Um, and it was partly fear. I don't, I don't think it was an intentional lie. I mean, I, I, I mean, it could be wrong, but I think it's. I think it was It was fear driven by uh, the unknown. Um, we're no longer in that state. We know, for instance, that there's a thousand-fold difference in the mortality risk. Young people face very little risk from the infection should they get, should they get infected. Um, they face much greater risk from the lockdown. Uh, people who uh, uh, who fear COVID more than cancer don't get chemotherapy. We have had uh, in the United States one in four young adults seriously considered suicide in June. Uh, one in four. Um, the uh, the uh, the people have stayed home instead of getting treatment from heart attacks because of fear of COVID strokes. Um, worldwide, we're seeing 130 million additional people who are at risk of starvation as a result of COVID. One and a half million additional cases of tuber- tuberculosis. Uh, the, the rise again in malaria, a, a cancellation of vaccine campaigns. It is the damage is catastrophic now, and it's not it's not subtle. Uh, there is more harm from the lockdown than from COVID. And of course, this is before we get to an even larger potential number in relation to a future death toll, which is that if you damage national economies, you create poverty, and it is well documented that poverty kills. Yeah, I mean, I think we've lifted one billion people out of poverty in the last 20 years because of rising GDP. Um, we uh, we basically are going to reverse a lot of that and, and with catastrophic damage. It's not just money. That money saves lives. It extends lives. It's, it buys health. Um, so I think uh, in the early days, there was this false dichotomy between, well, we, could, we can just hunker down for a little while at, at some cost to the economy and then we'll, we'll be fine. I think that was a mistake. We we forgot that this these dollars are not just simply dollars; they're they're lives. Um, we are hearing from the chief scientific advisors to the government, who, by the way, I'm sure are good people with our best interests at heart, and they're they're you know extremely uh, eminent scientists. But of course, that doesn't mean that they're wrong on this one. But the message we're hearing from those advisors is that. If cases rise, which they are, particularly in the north of England at the moment, if you see cases rise, then that means that not necessarily a high mortality rate among younger people, but those people will come into contact with vulnerable groups and then you have more deaths and more hospitalizations. Do you accept this argument that rising cases eventually feed through to a higher death toll? No. In fact, we're seeing the opposite in many places. Spain, for instance, famously during its second wave has had an enormous increase in cases with, with a, without a commensurate increase in deaths. Similar things you've seen elsewhere. The key is not cases. Tracking cases is not the right metric. The right metric is how well are we protecting the vulnerable? How many cases among the old older people? How many, pay, how many I mean, that is really the right metric to think about. Um, the, the rise in cases tells us nothing. You have a, uh, you, if you have a rise in cases in school age populations who don't die from this or die very at very low rates from this, uh, all that leads to is closure of schools, which itself causes harm. So I think the focus on cases has been in a, in a mistake, sort of like how you think about uh, during the Vietnam War, people focused on how many body bags were, were coming back, how many how many you know people we, we, we killed. That, <clears throat> that was the wrong metric. That is not how you track whether you're winning or losing a war. Uh, cases is the same thing. But that's not how you track whether we are doing well or doing poorly with COVID. The, the key question is, how well are we protecting the vulnerable? Um, Professor uh, Bhattacharya, would you like to give me your blueprint, blueprint for the way forward now? You have the ear of the President of the United States, uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the Chancellor of Germany, the Prime Minister of Spain. What What is the way forward now? I think we have to use our considerable resources of each of these countries to protect the vulnerable. And we know who they are. Be creative, protect nursing homes, 
if there are places where community spread is high, uh, offer people who live in multi-generational homes uh, an opportunity to live in hotels for a little while, yeah. short while, while till the, till uh, sort of protect them to be protect them, um, and then let everyone else live their lives. Set everybody free. Open our schools. Have our arts uh, flourish again. Have our culture flourish again. Let our ho houses of worship uh, operate again. Uh, let us live our lives openly and freely. Uh, COVID is there, and we have to cope with it, just as we will have to cope. We cope with two hundred, hundreds of other uh, infectious diseases. Uh, we don't upend our lives on them. We take appropriate precautions, but we we understand that there are there's more to life than infection control. Um, we continue to wash our hands. Uh, do we need? Would you suggest to still distance with some discretion, such as a meter? I mean, I think in some places it might be appropriate, like for instance, masks in hospitals, absolutely. You're, you're, or in, in places where there's uh, high infection spread, uh, you, 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 you know, I think it might be, make some sense to distance. Um, and and uh, so I think there, it's not that we would do nothing. Uh, for instance, Sweden famously didn't do nothing. It, it just gave appropriate advice to the public who then used it at their discretion. So if you're riding your bike outside, there's no need for a mask. You're not going to get sick from you're alone riding your bike outside. If you're in a very, very crowded space where it's hard to distance, then maybe a mask might be reasonable. I mean, I think uh, we trust people. We give people the correct information based on the science and we trust them with it as opposed to a, a mandate that forces uh, people to, to, to comply and then essentially shames people that don't. I mean, that's bad public health messaging. We should not create a situation that disunites one. Uh, with with mask policy, because that has become quite a totemic issue uh, around the world, uh, would you suggest the way forward with face coverings is to make them discretionary or is it still worth mandating them in case they work? No, I think I mean, there's there's no randomized evidence, for instance, that mandated mask mandates work. Uh, and there's no evidence um, from other infections like that are randomized that, that in, like in, in influenza, where mask mandates have had an appreciable effect on the. Now, masks are very, very important in some settings. As I said, in hospitals, I'm not against masks, uh, just so we're clear. I think mask mandates do more harm than good. I think they create uh, the situation where people that wear masks think that they're. Uh, helping people and people that don't wear masks thinks they're they're in favor of individual freedom and it creates this disunity that is inimical to what good public health policy should seek to create. Um, the fact that it has become such a divisive issue is evidence that we've failed in the public health uh, messaging around this. A final question. We know you are extremely busy, Professor. Um, what chance do you have of being heard by these major Western governments? I hope I, I hope your show and others uh, and and the discussion that the Great Barrington Declaration uh, has brought forward will create a discussion in these places. I think um, it's high time for such a discussion. For a long time, we've been been uh, told that we are not allowed to dissent, uh, but the science strongly favors the policies that we're suggesting. And I think once people understand what those policies actually will accomplish and the harms that the current policy is doing, I think uh, I, I'm very hopeful. Indeed. Um, long term, I mean, if we continue with these strategies, we could be doing more harm than good. I, I did promise you a final question. Apologies. This is what they call in journalism the final final. Um, but um, herd immunity and the future. I mean, is there an argument that we've interfered with nature by trying to slow the rate of infections of COVID-19? And have we done more harm than good as we go into cold winter months? Yeah, I think we have. We've done more harm than good. Uh, we essentially have pushed off the cases to the future in a t at a time when we're not actually going to be capable of dealing with it um, effectively. So I think that, uh, that I think your your diagnosis is the right one. Um, I think the the collateral damage from the the current policy has been enormous. And as you can see, we, uh, most places that have instituted lockdowns are not through with the epidemic, whereas places that have been lighter with the lockdowns uh, are, seem like they're closer to done. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that it, it's it, this is probably the, the, the single biggest public health mistake I've seen in my career.